welcome back to the cafe. I'm your barista Kaz, and I'm here to serve you some interesting content today. So today we're gonna to be talking about homebrew rules. Talking about rules that are more cinematic and make your games much more interactive, faster paced. Maybe your games have just been too mechanical. Maybe they've been kind of bland and that's perfectly fine. But today I'm gonna to share with you five rules that you can implement today and your games will feel way more cinematic. So without further ado, let's just kind of jump right on into it. Number five, simply just let whatever side acts go first. We're gonna be a removing initiative here. What this does for your game, it's a couple of things. First and foremost, you're not tracking initiative anymore. That whole sometimes five plus minute period of okay this monster goes and uh, initiative 13 and this one at 12 and oh you got a 12 as well that whole scenario of having to figure out the initiative list it's great when you're coming up with these strategy games and it coming from what DD is it totally makes sense but in a game that you want to make more cinematic just remove initiative instead what you do the players take their turn and then the enemies take their turn. It's like the Marvel Civil War. Captain America's team's coming in on the one side and Iron Man's team coming on the other. And it doesn't break your game because it's still in turn structure as if you were in initiative, but you just didn't actually track the initiative. You know? And the second thing that this does is it lets your players weave together their attacks to create a more cinematic moment. So that's something that I absolutely recommend adding to your game, or I guess really in this case, taking away. All right, number four, pooling your enemy hit points. And so when I say pooling, I quite literally mean you just add all the goblins hit points together and all the kobolds together into two separate pools. Every type of enemy gets their own pool of hit points. So goblins typically have six hit points. Instead of tracking six hit points for this goblin, six for that goblin, the six for that goblin, you're just putting three goblins together in a pool of 18 hit points. Whenever a total of six hit points is lost, one of the goblins dies. You see, it's still similar, right? You still have the idea of goblins dying at six hit points, but the extra damage just kind of carries over to the next one and carries over to the next one. What this ends up doing and how this makes it more cinematic, the beginning of the fight is going to end up lasting longer. You're players are going to attack this goblin and that goblin and that goblin and that goblin they're going to feel like man this goblin over here he's really strong he's taking like five hits but these three over here they've they've fallen it ends up making this whole fight feel way more cinematic number three this is sort of a two for one special here, okay? Don't tell anybody else I'm giving you this special deal. The two roles of pushing the roll and rolling with emphasis. Pushing the roll, you just get to roll again. Your players get to roll again, looking for the same level of success. They don't get disadvantaged, they don't whatever. However, if they fail, the push roll, it's a worse outcome. Maybe they're trying to look into some cultists that they've been trying to follow. Instead of, you know, they fail and they can't figure anything out in the library, maybe they push the roll, they try longer. They really want to push this roll and try again, looking for the same level of success. They can push the roll but maybe they fail the push roll. Now the cultists somehow know that the players are looking for this bit of information. The enemies now have more knowledge on what the players are doing or some other effect. You decide you're the storyteller. Using the push roll will allow you to do that. The other roll, rolling with emphasis, is where you roll 2d20. It's not advantage or disadvantage. It's whichever roll is furthest from 10. You're looking to get a success or a failure. You're looking to see what result ends up being more dramatic. If you have further from 10 is your success, you end up succeeding greatly. If you fail though, you end up failing spectacularly because you're much more likely when you're rolling with emphasis to either get like a 17 and an eight or two and a 12. So your 17, two are the numbers that are gonna end up causing your story to have more of that cinematic feel. It's gonna drive the story in a much more dynamic way. And that's really what you want when you're adding rolling mechanics is something that's gonna make it more cinematic, more fun, give your players some tension to, to play with and, and feel. Number two, pushing your limits. This one, if included, won't really come up all that often, but it really does make for some cinematic moments. So using levels of exhaustion, you can let your players cast spells or use their abilities that recharge on a long rest. This allows for much more explosive battles that really could end in characters choosing to sacrifice themselves to allow for the heroic moments that the players dream of. If you wanna cast a spell that you just don't have slots for, 
You can. You just take levels of exhaustion equal to half the spell's level. I round down simply because the detriment of exhaustion with the 2014 handbook is so high and it accumulates very quickly if you're using this rule as well as the next rule that I'm about to talk about here. If you're using the UA exhaustion for the spells, I will recommend just one level of exhaustion per spell slot level. Using abilities is the same idea. If you want to use that extra Barbarian's Rage or a Fighter's Second Wind, you can. It costs between one to four levels of exhaustion, kind of depending on the number of times that you can use that ability before needing long rest. The math is in my homebrew document linked down below. I recognize this is a pretty niche rule. It's not something that's going to come up all that often, but I really do recommend it. My players have been having tons of fun with it, and it's just made for a lot of cinematic moments at my tables. Number one, exhaustion death saves. All right, so this is the top rule that has made my games way more cinematic, exponentially so. What we do at my table is we don't go unconscious at zero hit points. We instead enter into the, like a dying condition. Fall prone, you take one level of exhaustion, and you do make death saves, but you're still conscious. Whenever you fail a death save, you take two levels of exhaustion to kind of represent that you're bleeding out. Things are tough, things are looking bleak. You're fighting for your life at this point. Exhaustion levels don't go away very fast. I do have some faster recovery methods as well in my homebrew document that I've linked down below, but generally speaking, one level of exhaustion takes one full long rest to heal. This makes the sting of hitting zero hit points much, much bigger. You can still stabilize if you get three successful death saves, and if you get a critical success, instead of just healing one hit point, you heal your hit dice plus your constitution modifier worth of hit points. And you get to include your constitution modifier, your con save modifier, right? So if you're proficient in constitution saves, you get your proficiency bonus as well. And it is still a DC 10 constitution save. And I just do that to sort of mitigate how easy it is to accumulate exhaustion levels with my rules, but at the same time, Time, I want it to mean something. I want hitting zero hit points to feel terrifying and it has made for so many cinematic moments. I've had players run into battle where they know that they're probably not coming back alive but they're defending their friends. They go in, they take a critical hit, they fall to the ground, they take uh, one more hit of damage and then they take one more critical hit and they die. They get like you know all the final parting words but they've made their decision. What this ends up letting you do to the way it makes it more cinematic is that they get that choice. They can choose to run away. They can choose to make that heroic sacrifice with the last rule, that ninth level meteor swarm, and go out in a bang. They have the choice. It completely enables player agency. More importantly, it just kind of keeps them playing. With regular death saves, you're not really playing. You're just kind of rolling a die. Nothing cinematic going on. No storytelling is happening. So why are you just sitting there? So that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed these rules and I hope to see that some of these rules get adopted by plenty of tables and that you all have fun. And if you really didn't enjoy any of these rules or if you really contest one of these rules, let me know. Cause I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear what rules make your tables more cinematic and your games more fun. And if there's anything that you want to hear from me down below, maybe more of my rules, maybe you want to see my update on the Ranger Beastmaster where you can really be a master of beasts. Let me know down below what you're looking forward to. I hope you enjoyed your beverage of choice and I hope you enjoyed the content. As always, thanks for coming to the cafe. See you guys soon.